Hello and welcome to Lee Algebras. In today's second lecture of the course, we will talk about basic representations here. So let's start with a quick recap and setup. We work over an arbitrary field K. So we consider G to be a Lie algebra over K. This means that G is a vector space over K equipped with a binary bilinear operation which is usually called the Lie bracket and which is assumed to be anti-commutative and satisfies a Jacobi identity. We will study representations of G on vector spaces over K, so we fix a vector space V over K and consider the general linear Lie algebra of V. This is a Lie algebra of all linear endomorphisms of V where the operation is the commutator of linear maps. So the set of all linear endomorphisms of V is an associative algebra with respect to the composition of maps. And GLV is a Lie algebra associated to this associative algebra. It is the same set, but it is equipped with a different binary operation. The new operation is the commutator of the linear maps. The commutator is defined as a difference between the composition of these maps in two different orders. Okay, so now we can define the notion of a representation. A representation of our Lie algebra G on V is a Lie algebra homomorphism phi from G to GLV. We should think about this in the following way. The representation phi realizes each element of our Lie algebra as a linear operator on V. And this realization should be constructed such that the linear bracket in G corresponds to the commutator of linear operators. Let's consider a couple of examples. The first example, the trivial example, if we have any Lie algebra G and any vector space V, we can define the trivial representation of G on V by realizing each element in G as a zero linear operator on V. Then, Obviously, this is a homomorphism of Lie algebras from G to GLV, so the whole of G is mapped to the zero vector, and the Lie bracket is obviously preserved. And the second, also fairly easy example, is that the Lie algebra GLV itself is defined by its representation. So it has a defining representation on V, which is given by the identity map. The identity map is obviously a homomorphism of Lie algebras. So this defining representation is sometimes also called tautological representation of GLV on V. In the representation series, there is an alternative language to speak about representations, and this is a language of modules. So let's give the corresponding definitions for Lie algebras. A module over a Lie algebra G is a pair consisting of a vector space V and the action map from G cross V to V. And this is the map which is assumed to be bilinear, so it's linear in both arguments, and it should also have the property described by this equality. This property says that the bracket of two elements G and H in G acts on an element V in V in the same way at the right-hand side of the equality. And the right-hand side reads that it's a difference between two summons, and the first says that we start with V, first act by H, and then by G, and then we subtract the element obtained by acting on V first by G, and then by H. So effectively, we say that the bracket of elements G, H should act as the commutator of the linear maps described by G and H, which is exactly the definition of a representation. So given any G module V, we can consider the map from G to GLV, which is defined in the following way. So the image under this map of an element G in G is the linear transformation of V obtained by plugging in G as the first argument in the action map. And it is clear from this expression 
that the map phi is a homomorphism of Lie algebras and hence defines a representation of G on V. Conversely, if we have a representation of G on V given by a homomorphism phi from G to GLV, then setting, defining the action map as G dot V equals to the image of V under the linear transformation phi of G, this defines on V the structure of a G module. Because of that, the two notions of representation and module, they are synonyms and we will use them interchangeably in what follows. One could maybe point out a slight difference is that when we speak about representations, we put the main emphasis on the homomorphism phi, while when we speak about modules, we put the main emphasis on what happens to the elements of V when we act on them by elements from G. So let us consider another very important example of a representation called the adjoint representation. This is a representation of the Lie algebra G on itself. And this representation is defined as the Lie algebra homomorphism, which is called ADD, adjoint, from G to the general linear Lie algebra GL of G, and this Lie algebra homomorphism is given by the following formula. So for an element G in G, the linear operator add G evaluated at an element X in G is defined as a bracket between G and X. It is not obvious that this definition gives a representation. So there is something to be checked here, namely, we need to check that the adjoint map corresponding to the bracket of G and H when applied to element X can be rewritten as the commutator of the adjoint maps for G and H. So we need to check this equality. So if we use the definition of the adjoint map and write down the definition for the adjoint map on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, this inequality becomes this inequality. So add bracket G of H applied to X is the bracket of the bracket of G of H applied to X. So here we have add H of X. So this is a bracket of H of X and add G applied to this. So this is a bracket of G with a bracket of H of X and similarly the last sum. So we have this equality and we need to prove this. And the claim is that it reduces to the Jacobi identity using the anti-commutativity of the Lie bracket. So recall that the Jacobi identity says that the sum of the same bracketing of three elements, when we cyclically shift the arguments, is equal to zero. So here on the left-hand side, we have the bracketing, the bracket of G of H bracketed with X. So let's look at the right-hand side. So here we have the bracket of G with HX. So if we move this to the left-hand side, then we will get the sign minus. But also we need to swap G and the bracket of H and X to have the same bracketing. So because of the anti-commutativity of the Lie bracket, this will give one more minus. And so we will have the total plus for the summand, the bracket of the bracket of H, X, and G. Similarly, the last summand, when we move it over, the minus before the sum disappears, but then we need to change the bracket between H and GX, and then we need to change the bracket, the order of G and X in the inside bracket. So which means that we will get two more minuses, which will give us plus. So this equality is exactly the Jacobi identity. And this completes the proof that the adjoint representation is indeed a representation of the Lie algebra G. Okay, so we have seen a couple of examples of representations. Let's talk about the maps between representations. So these are homomorphisms of modules or representations. So assume that we have two G modules, the vector space V with the action map dot sub V and the vector space W with the action map dot sub w. A linear map eta from v to w is called the g-module homomorphism, provided that 
it intertwines the action of the Lie algebra G on the vector spaces V and W. Namely, this means that when we apply eta to the element G dot sub V of V, we should get the element G dot sub W applied to eta of V. And this should hold for any G in G and V in V. In diagrammatic terms, this means that the following diagram commutes. So this is a diagram where in the top row uh, we have the linear transformation from V to V given by the action of our small element G. In the second row we have similarly linear transformation from W to W given by the action of the small element G. And in the vertical columns we have the linear transformation eta which defines our G module homomorphism. So this diagram should commute for each element G in our Lie algebra G. A couple of easy examples. Of course, the zero linear map is a homomorphism between any pair of G modules. So if in this diagram this eta is equal to zero and this eta is equal to zero, then the diagram obviously commutes because both paths in this diagram are equal to zero. Also, the identity map is an endomorphism of any G module V. So if V is equal to W and the first row is equal to the second row, and if both columns are identities, then the diagram obviously commutes. So we can observe then composition of G module homomorphisms is again a G module homomorphism. This allows us to define the category G capital mod of all G modules in the following way. Objects of this category are all G modules. Morphisms in this category are all G module homomorphisms between G modules. If you have G modules V and W, then morphisms in this category from V to W are all possible G module homomorphisms from V to W. Composition of morphisms is given by composition of linear maps and the identity morphisms are given by the identity linear transformations. On the last slide, we noted that the identity linear transformations always define endomorphisms of any G module. And also we have the category G little mod, and this is defined to be the full subcategory of G capital mod, consisting of all finitely generated G modules. There is a standard notation, then the set of all morphisms in the category G mod from V to W is denoted in the following way. So this is the usual categorical notation, G mod VW, but it is usually denoted home, home sub G from V to W. So the category G mod is K linear. It means that if you have two G modules V and W, then the set of all G module homomorphisms from V to W forms a K vector space, and the composition of uh, morphisms in this category is bilinear over K. And the category G mod is also abelian. This means that we have kernels and co kernels for morphisms between G modules plus we can form direct sum sums and so on. So let's first talk about submodules and quotients. Assume that we have a G module V. A submodule of V is a subspace in V which is stable under the action of G. This means that if you take an element in G and a vector in W and act by G on W, you will get a new vector in W. So, for example, the zero subspace and the whole of V are always submodules for any module V. Given a submodule W of V, we can consider the quotient vector space V modulo W and define on this quotient vector space the action of G in the following way. So, if we have an element G in our Lie algebra G and we have a coset, little v plus the subspace w, then we define the action of g on this coset in the following way. So we act on our coset representative v 
and take the corset which contains this g of v. And the claim, as usual, is that this defines on the quotient space the structure of a g module, and this is the quotient of the big module v by the submodule w. There is something to check here. One needs to check that this is well defined, but this is a standard computation which is based on the fact that w is stable under the action of g. And we have the first isomorphism theorem for Lie algebra modules. Given two g modules v and w, and the g module homomorphism eta from v to w, the kernel of eta, which is a subspace of v, is actually a submodule of v. The image of eta, which is a subspace of w, is actually a submodule of w. And the quotient of V by the kernel of eta is isomorphic to the image of eta by sending the coset V plus kernel of eta to eta of V. So it just basically says that the usual first isomorphism theorem for vector spaces induces a similar theorem for G modules. Okay, let's talk about some constructions of how we can get new G modules if we have some already constructed G modules. So we start with a direct sum of modules. If we have two G modules V and W, we can consider the direct sum of V and W, which is a vector space, which consists of all pairs V, W, where the first component of the pair is a vector in V and the second component of the pair is a vector in W. So this is a vector space with respect to the component-wise operations, so we add elements component-wise and multiply with scalars component-wise, and this is called the direct sum of V and W. So the claim is that the direct sum of V and W has a natural structure of G module defined component-wise. In other words, if we act by an element G on the pair VW, we get the pair where the first component is the outcome of the action of G on V, and the second component is the outcome of the action of G on W. For all elements G in G, V in V, and W in W. And the usual notation, if we have a G module V and a non-negative integer N, then the notation V with the upper index, the direct sum N, denotes the zero module if N is equal to zero, or the n fold direct sum of v, so v plus v plus v n times, if n is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, let's now talk about tensor product of G modules. Let v and w be G modules. Recall the definition of the tensor product of vector spaces. The tensor product of vector spaces v and w is defined as the quotient space, where we start from a very big vector space with a basis consisting of symbols v tensor w, where v in v and w in w. And we take the quotient of this big vector space, modulo the subspace i, which is generated by all possible vectors of the form given by these four expressions. These expressions effectively say that the first coordinate of the tensor product is k-linear with respect to the vector space structure in V, and the second coordinate of the tensor product is k-linear with respect to the vector space structure on W. So this is a definition of the tensor product of vector spaces. Now, if we additionally know that V and W are G modules, then the claim is that this tensor product of V and W, so this big vector space, has the natural structure of a G module given by the following formula. So if we have an element G in G and the pair of vectors V in V and W in W, then we define that G acts on this pair V tensor W in the following way. So it gives us a sum of two vectors. The first one is we act by G on V and take tensor with W. And the second one, we take the tensor of V with the image of W under the action of G. Note that this defines the action of the element G only on the vectors of the form V tensor W from our big tensor product vector space. 
this should be extended to the whole tensor product of vector spaces using the linearity property for the action of G. And uh, similarly, we have the usual notation that the zero tensor power of any G module is defined to be the trivial one-dimensional G module, so the one-dimensional ve vector space with a trivial action of G, and the nth tensor power of a module V is just the product of tensor product of n factors each isomorphic to V. There is something to be checked here. First of all, we need to check that this formula defines a well-defined linear operator on the vector space V tensor over K W. This is a standard exercise because this formula clearly defines a linear operator on the big space, which is used for the definition of the tensor product. And we need to check that the subspace, which we factor out when we define the tensor product, is stable under this action. So this follows from the linearity of the action of G on V and W. We also need to check that this defines on this space the structure of a G module, which means that this formula gives us a Lie algebra homomorphism from our Lie algebra G to the Lie algebra GL on V tensor W. In other words, what we need to check, we need to check that the Lie bracket of the elements of G and H in G when acting on the element of the form V tensor W is equal to the commutator of the linear operators of G and H when acting on the same way. So let's do the corresponding computation. It's not very trivial. So we start with the left-hand side. So in the left-hand side, we have the Lie bracket of the elements G and H applied to the vector V tensor W. So first of all, we use the definition of how the, an element of G acts on the tensor product. This commutator is an element in G, so we can use the definition of how elements in G act on elements in the tensor product of this form. And by the definition, we should take our bracket, act on the first element, tensor with the second element, and then add the first element, tensor with the bracket, action on the second element. So now here we have the bracket of G and H acting on the element V. So here everything is going on inside the G module V, which we know is a G module. So we can use the fact that V is a G module to rewrite this as the commutator of the action of linear operators G and H in the G module V. So we can rewrite it as G of H of V minus h of g of v inside the g module v. And then we use the linearity of the tensor product with respect to the first argument to get this expression. Similarly, for the second summand, we have the action of the bracket of g and h in the module w. w is a g module, so we can use the properties that the bracket there acts as the commutator of linear operators, and we write the bracket action on W as G of H of W minus H of G of W and use the linearity of the tensor product with respect to the second argument to get the second expression. So now comes the complicated thing. I want to rearrange this formula. So, so GHV tensor W is here minus GHV tensor W is here V tensor GHW is here, minus V tensor HGW is here. But then I add and subtract some extra summons. So here is a summon GV tensor HW with plus and then with minus, so they just cancel each other. And similarly, here is a blue summon HV tensor GW with plus and with minus. So I didn't do really anything. I rearranged our expression and added and subtracted some extra summons. But then let's see what we have here. So here we have GHV tensor W plus HV tensor GW. By the definition, this is exactly the action of G on the element HV tensor W. So in the second line, we similarly have the action of G on the element V tensor HW. So the third line gives us the action of H 
on GV tensor W with a minus sign, and the last line gives us the action of H on V tensor GW. So altogether we have this expression, and now inside the bracket here, we get the action of H on V tensor W, and in the bracket here, we have the action of G on V tensor W. And this is exactly what we want. The bracket of GH, when acted on V tensor W, gives us the commutator of the actions of H and G on the same element. So this proves that our tensor product formula really defines on the tensor product of V and W the structure of a G module. Okay, let's talk about various types of modules. The usual notion of simple module. If we have a G module V, we say that this module is simple if it is non-zero and the only submodules of V are zero and V. We have already noticed that any module has a zero submodule and the whole module as a submodule. So a module is simple if there is nothing else, and additionally, if the module is non zero. And in representation language, one usually says irreducible representation. So the notion of a simple module is a synonym for the notion of an irreducible representation. An easy example any module of dimension one is simple because it doesn't have any subspaces different from zero and v, let alone submodules. So it's a trivial. State. So the next uh, class of modules we define is the class of indecomposable modules. We say that a module V is indecomposable if it is non-zero, and for any attempt to write V as a direct sum of two modules, one of the summons must be zero. Clearly, if we can write V as a direct sum of two non-zero modules, then each of them gives rise to a non-trivial submodule of V, different from zero and V. In other words, all simple modules are clearly indecomposable. Okay, let's uh, try to consider one explicit example and classify simple modules over the one-dimensional Lie algebra. So now let's assume that K is an algebraically closed field and G is a Lie algebra over k of dimension 1. Then the anti-commutativity of the operation says explicitly that the Lie bracket on G is identically 0. So it's an abelian Lie algebra. Because of that, a G module is just a vector space V on which our fixed non-zero element G in G acts as a linear operator. So then the condition that the commutator of this linear operator with itself should be zero is automatically satisfied because any linear operator commutes with itself. So there is no condition coming from the requirement that our map should be a homomorphism of Lie algebras. Consequence, any module is just a vector space with a fixed linear operator representing the action of G, and the homomorphism between modules is a linear map between vector spaces which commutes or intertwines the action of our chosen linear operators. In other words, the category of G modules is equivalent to the category of modules over the polynomial algebra in one variable, let's call it G. And therefore, we can use the classical classification of indecomposable finitely generated modules over the polynomial algebra to conclude that indecomposable finitely generated G modules are classified by Jordan cells over K. So this Jordan cell prescribes the action of G. So in this way, we have now completely classified all finitely generated indecomposable modules over a one-dimensional Lie algebra over an arbitrary algebraically closed field. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed the lecture.